This is Make It Then Tell Everybody. I'm Dan Berry. Uh, this is a special episode of Make It Then Tell Everybody, and it was recorded live in the flesh analog one to one with Luke Pearson. Luke and I talked process, becoming part of the comics community, and responding to compliments. Uh, this episode was made possible by your kind donations. It paid for me to travel to Luke's house and back. So if you like this and if you want to help out, go to makeitthentelleverybody.com and have a look at the very modest sums of money I'm asking for. Strength in numbers, people. Okay, back to my chat with Luke. This is Make It Then Tell Everybody. Okay, so this this is definitely recording. Cool. Um, Luke Pearson. That's me. Uh, thank you very much for welcoming me into your home. You're very welcome. Yeah. So, uh, at the moment, we're sat in your studio. Yeah, I guess you could call it that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why? What would you normally call it? I don't know. My room. Sometimes I call it my bedroom, even though there isn't a bed in here. No. It just feels like... I don't know. It's, I guess it's just a room in my house, so it feels like... Uh, well, it's an upstairs room as well, isn't it? So yeah. it, that's where the bedrooms are. It doesn't are. feel like a studio. It doesn't feel like a cool like artist studio. It just feels like like a parent's bedroom that has my desk in it <laughs> stuff on the walls, you know. Because it's got those nice big windows. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of like a horrible mirror that isn't mine on the wall. That's nice. Um, it's all right. It's clearly been decorated by someone wanting just a nice bedroom. It's, it's very nice. I'll I'll I'll, I'll right, go that far. It? I'll it's say okay. it, it seems fit for purpose. Yeah, it does cool. the job. So uh, people should probably know who you are, but you draw comics and I illustrations and stuff. Draw comics and illustrations, and yeah, I guess that's mainly it. That's mainly it. Yeah, and some <laughs> kind of animation stuff, kind of uh, video game stuff. I guess uh, not. Not really, but I've, I've done some designs for a video game. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've done lots of things, kind of like once. Right. Or a couple of times. You never got asked um, back. No. <laughs> well, that's the negative way of looking at it. <laughs> I like to think of it as I've just got a... A, a broad yeah. base. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, no, I, you're <laughs> right, I was totally negative about that. I'm nagging you already. I'm so sorry. Um, so, how did you get into comics then? Um, well, like most people, um, I feel like... I feel like I've, I guess I drew them when I was a kid... As I, th- I feel like a lot of people who have always drawn did, you know. I don't know, stuff like like I'd read the Beano when I was younger. Yeah. As, again, almost everyone in Britain who does comics seemed to do. Yeah. It just seemed like a, a thing, like just at Christmas I'd get a Beano annual, and I guess that goes back a long time. Yeah. Um, I don't know what exactly what my first exposure was, but I always think it's kind of like that. And um, I used to read... I remember my uncle had sort of like a full set of... Asterix comics. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, which I kind of tore through. And also at my grandma's house, there was like a big stack of my uncle's old 2000 ADs that were there uh, for yeah, a long yeah. time. So every time I would go there, I'd be kind of plowing through those, and I was, which I was way too young for. But yeah. I always feel like those kind of three things were probably my early... Exposure. Yeah, yeah. And so you... Did you... Spent, I mean, because I think the way I got into comics was copying uh, Asterix and Garfield comics and yeah. you know, trying to pick apart how they were drawn. I don't remember. I don't actually remember doing that. I think from quite early on, I was making up my own stuff. I was just kind of. I can remember doing stuff that was kind of in the vein of something like really wacky stuff that kind of looked like I was trying to draw something for the from the Beano and come up with yeah. like wacky names for like funny animal characters, but they were usually really kind of violent as well. <laughs> I used to like just coming up with the most... Like, I would always... It seemed like I was drawing comics then to show to basically, like, my parents and my grandparents. Yeah. And there was definitely a point where I was trying to come up with the most shocking possible thing. Like, for some reason, I really enjoyed, like, drawing something horribly unpleasant and then showing (laughs) my closest relatives, like, (laughs) what horrible thing I'd come up with. And they didn't stamp that out of you, really, then? They seemed to encourage it. Oh, really? I always... (laughs) That's, I don't know, I always got a kick very out of their reaction parenting. or something, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just always like doing that. But I, then I also, also used to draw this comic called, like, Super Rabbit. I used to draw Super Rabbit comics. He was my character, mm. my really original character. 
yeah. it's just like a, a rabbit with a cape who like evolved over the years but I would always draw him I always draw him specifically at my grandma's house and would kind of finish it and then like pat, fold it together and then like hand it to her and then kind of watch like wait eagerly as she like read through it and she would always be like really <laughs> enthusiastic and really kind of make a big deal about it like she was really excited for the next one and I would I really liked that yeah. and I feel like that's kind of the similar kind of response I'm looking for now because it was she was like my first proper kind of reader yeah, fan audience almost. yeah 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 definitely so are you trying to say that you you crave validation now for what you're doing well I like hearing people's responses to stuff you know that's one of the nicest parts of it is like having a finished thing and putting it out there and yeah. someone's saying something nice about it you know like I do yeah. genuinely like that yeah I think obviously I, I think I like that but I don't like uh, what's the best way to put this? I don't like responding to it. No. I, I, if it was, you know, a, a, a jar of sweets that someone gave me, like, well done, I wouldn't want to sit there and like, have them watch me eat it. I'd no, like I to totally go into a different mean. room and, and eat those sweets. And I think the compliments are the same. I don't like Yeah, I don't know what to do. To I don't know what to do with them anymore. Yeah. I mean, I'll try and be... <laughs> you can't really take I'm a compliment grateful. into another room and no, sort of roll no, around no, on no, top no. of it, sort of rubbing it into your skin no. or anything. I can remember a time when I first started putting stuff on the internet and I used to... Like, I just posted on DeviantArt for a long time, like, for a lot of years. And I can remember when I first started getting comments and stuff, I would reply to every single one. And I'd be so super grateful for any any comment that came my way. But now I feel like I'm kind of a, a prick now because I, I, don't, I don't know how to respond. <laughs> so like I, still, I still want to, like, sort of... Like, I still am really grateful for anything anyone... Yeah says positively about my work and I'd like to respond but it gets to the point where it's kind of weird you know like you don't want to be saying thanks to literally every, yeah. anything anyone says to you and so is, is this largely on Twitter then or on your blog or? yeah I guess well Twitter especially I don't I, I barely tweet anymore because yeah. I feel like I, I just don't know what to do I don't know I, yeah. kind of, I well, feel like I'm not like because you've got a lot of followers uh, yeah do, do well, you visualise them so as like one enormous group of people watching you sort of sort of um I definitely don't see it like I don't have that many followers but I have a decent amount I think um but I don't think of them as like they're all like my fans yeah. I think of the majority of them are kind of people who've seen me on some blog or something it, it, well I see like obviously I look at everyone who they turn up in my spam box saying new follower or whatever yeah it seems like the majority of them are kind of students yeah or some kind of like I don't know like aspiring artist well, like, sort of seems like like little companies or something. And I don't see them as, like, someone who necessarily wants to follow my work. It's just someone who's kind of, I don't know, yeah. kind of bookmarking me somehow. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can see that, yeah. It seems I, like I that's get... the place to follow people now. Like, you find them on Twitter and then you kind of tag them there. Like, no one's... I don't think anyone really... Like, it used to be the thing where people would put you in their Google Rudy, you know, but now yeah. that doesn't that's exist. Now, yeah. mm. Well, I think that you, when you... When you see people follow you and they follow, you know, 15,000 people, you kind of think, well, what's the point? You know, why, why are you doing that? You know, there, there is, there's literally no way that you're going to be able to pick out my one, you know, voice yeah, yeah, out of that, yeah. that crowd. It's a bit strange. Hmm. So you, you, you started by putting things on DeviantArt then? Yeah, well, I, I didn't start doing okay. that. So where, where did you start? Well, actually, my first place of any, ever put anything on the internet was... Um, <laughs> Elfwood. Elfwood? Elfwood, which was... Um, Wait, what's this? <laughs> it's like a, like a fantasy. It's kind of like a... It's li- like deviant art, but predates it, and it's specifically for fantasy art. It was specifically for fantasy art, like high fantasy, like just... It's basically just loads of pictures of elves and okay. such. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of became like fantasy and sci-fi art. Right. Um but it was a really complicated, weird site. I think it's, it, I mean, it's still there. But it was, it's funny, like, you had to... Every single piece you submitted had to go through this sort of, like, week-long moderation <laughs> process. Like, oh, everything... Wow. Like, someone was looking at every single piece that went up and saying that was okay. Um, yes, no. And it was organised in a really complicated, strange way. And it's, yeah, it's still there. And actually, my, my page is still there. Oh, so um, people can changed, go and look I at it? I changed my name on it, so you... Uh, <laughs> but so I, people can't find you? No, I don't know, actually. You probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did this for that, that's why. 
<laughs> but it's been long enough now that like I'm actually not so embarrassed about it. I was really embarrassed about it. Yeah. But um, enough time's passed. I can uh, that you can sleep easy with it. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Yeah. But it is really funny. <laughs> is it good? No, it's not good. <laughs> so what was it? And it's way worse than it should have been, f- considering how old I actually was when I was putting that stuff so, up. So how old were you then? I think I was like 16, I guess. Old enough to know better. Probably. Yeah. 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 There's lots of pictures of really badly drawn, like, sort of, like, ladies with massive boobs. Yeah. Um, like, kind of generally sort of, like, demon-type ladies. <laughs> <laughs> usually they've got wings yeah uh, and some like fairies and stuff and then just sort of just sort of overly gross there's one picture of like a, then it's some guy who's just like a torso and he's being like tortured by a big slime monster and there's like beams of light coming out of him or something okay um yeah <laughs> <laughs> sounds great it's cool yeah it's really cool are you ever tempted to go back and redo those uh <laughs> maybe I'd like to <laughs> So there are some on there I'd like, I do actually want to kind of show people now because yeah. they're uh, cool. They're kind of funny. It sounds amazing. So when did you first start drawing comics? As you know, the, um, uh, as people would recognise like your comics now. Yeah, I think sort of during university. Mm-hmm. I think I, I always think it was like after I kind of found Chris Ware's comics or like some in some talk or something in some class at university someone one of the tutors brought up Chris Ware and was like talking about him and that I'm pretty sure that was my first introduction to him yeah um and it feels like some of my earliest comics that kind of look like the ones that I'm doing now were like as a result of seeing that stuff yeah um but I definitely done a, a sort of around that time kind of before then I was doing some I do the odd like small comic or small little strip I did some goofy little strips but not much it's weird because I, I feel like I always like I always sort of read comics and it was always kind of at the back of my mind that I'd, I'd like to draw comics um, but there was definitely some kind of gap in like probably while I was a teenager where I just don't think I was drawing them or I didn't yeah. think I was I didn't think I drew in the right way to be doing them or something I just it didn't seem to be yeah. So do do you think there's a difference between the way you draw for comics and the way you draw for illustration then? Uh sometimes sometimes definitely. I think one difference is that I just spend a lot longer on a single image in an illustration. But that stuff has kind of developed differently for me. Um like I have a couple sort of a couple of different illustration styles. Yeah. Um and I've definitely got a more kind of like flat <laughs> Designy kind of yeah, you work style with that I do sort of geomet- ge- yeah, geometric yeah, yeah. shapes geometric geometric that's the European version <laughs> of geometric shapes um, yeah so I do that kind of thing which look I feel like looks quite removed from my comics work um, but then I yeah. do other illustrations where like like that kind of flat stuff was what I was leaning towards when I was kind of towards the end of university yeah and up until quite near the end I was still kind of assuming I was just going to be doing illustration solidly. Yeah. Like, it still hadn't become apparent that comics was a thing that I would be able to do as anything other than a kind of... Hobby. Part. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess. And I hadn't and I hadn't done any, um, really, until the end. I hadn't even done, like, any small press stuff or anything. But now, now having... After I kind of was in a few comics and I had my first Hilda book out with No Brow... Yeah. Um seems like more and more when people do ask me for illustration they know me because of the comics and they want something that looks like something yeah. from a comic or is kind of related to comics in some way yeah like i did a book cover um for a penguin i did yeah. like a cover for lucky jim and they want and that was specifically they wanted that to look to be a kind of designed like a comics page yeah and look like my comics work Whereas my natural instinct for a book cover would not be to do that. Mm. It would be to do something simpler and more designed, you know, yeah. with less obvious, um, with less sort of like characters on the front. Yeah. You know? And so what was your first sort of, which was, which toe did you first dip into small press stuff? Then? <laughs> I don't know if that's a really good which question. Toe? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm, I'm very good at asking questions. I don't know if you noticed. It's, um, it's a talent. <laughs> um, I think what I'm trying to say is, how did you first get into the small press stuff? I don't really remember. I did well. I did like the cover to, and the comic in Solipsistic Pop too. Sure, yeah. Um, I remember that seeming like a really that's at that time felt like a massive deal to me, and I was really excited when Tom asked me to do that. Yeah, um, I'm still really happy with the stuff that I did for that, and that felt like a kind of turning point, or like something. a milestone. Yeah, um, but I can't remember. If, if, can't remember if I'd done a mini comic before then or not. I don't think I had, but it's kind of through that and maybe a couple of other things at the same, sort of near the same time that I kind of got to vaguely know some people from the scene. Yeah. Um, and started to pay more attention to that stuff, or just discover it at, at least. Yeah. Um, and I've, and I've, I mean, I've only done two mini comics. I did like one, one thing that I kind of had an idea that I was going to do regularly called Dull Lake. Yes, yeah. Um, there was like a couple of comics that I did specifically for that and um, some like sketchbook works and some just drawings and stuff. And I yeah. had the idea that I was going to keep doing that, but I just, just didn't. I did, did one <laughs> and then other things kind of turned up and I did those instead. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting because the, 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 the small press, you know, scene, I guess is, you know, one way of describing it in the UK, but it, it's, I don't know, do you think it's difficult to get into? To get into the small press scene? Yeah. Well, I mean, no, if, if you, you don't, you don't have to do it, anything. You just. But I, I remember finding it quite difficult because I didn't know anything about how to get into it. And as, as soon as I knew some people who did know how to get into it, and they sort of guided me through it myself. But uh, I think that from the outside, it can be yeah, quite daunting think, and difficult. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily apparent how to like get into it. I think I actually only did. I mean, I don't. I don't know how at what point you decide you're in it or into it yeah know, um because <laughs> they don't give you a badge no <laughs> but I, but I, I guess like going to conventions and stuff seems to be yeah part of that and that's Book, how i met a lot of people somewhere. yeah i think i only did that because edward ross yeah emailed me to say he was to ask if i wanted to share a table with him at, at mcm one yeah. time um and i hadn't i don't think i'd even considered going to a show before then. in fact i don't know if i even knew about any of them it just weren't on my radar at all. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because of that that I actually did the two mini comics that I did because I didn't have anything. So it's all Eddie know. Ross's fault? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I think it actually might be. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, well, well, thanks, Eddie, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you start out working with Nobra then? Um, well, I guess w- I kind of f- found out about them while I was at university because like when they started they were just doing illustration stuff and they seemed like one of the cool yeah new guys on the illustration scene so I was kind of following what they were doing and I thought that first anthology was really cool yeah um, well they had a really strong visual um, look you know the, yeah, the, there yeah, was yeah. A, a real a clear voice in what they were doing yeah I think I yeah, think there still is that as well yeah although it's kind of more diverse now I think yeah there was a very like strong look that they were going for initially yeah um, I mean obviously there still is but I just think there's more there's more stuff going on now especially since now that they they've kind of become a fully fledged comics publisher which yeah. they definitely weren't to start with but I got working with them because again, again I guess I think it was in the last year of university that they, were, they held like a, a competition oh this is the I've forgotten the name of it now it's called um it's people I've never met and conversations I've never had, I think, um, where you just had to sort of do two illustrations, basically, and, and a whole bunch of... Some, something like 20 or 30 kind of winning entries will be published in a book. Yeah. But that book never happened for whatever reason, but it didn't really matter for me because, like, that kind of worked. <laughs> like, that was I a foot in the door. Those, I think Alex just sent me an email saying, um, email me. <laughs> no, no, he sent me a comment saying, email me, which I did saying, hi, um, he said to email you, here I am. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and, and then and then it just happened that they were doing that 17 by 23 series, That's it, yeah. the whole point of which was to kind of give people who hadn't done a comic before the chance to do yeah. a published comic. And I think at that time as well, they were specifically focusing on 
illustrators, I suppose, the people who'd already done comic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Or like decided they were going to be cartoonists. Because I think beforehand it was just um, Ben Newman Mm -hmm. and Jack Teagle. Yeah. Who had done comics before, but still he was mainly known for his illustrations at that time, I guess. Yeah. So yeah. And when they asked, I had to come up with some ideas for that and um, Hilda was the idea that we went with. Yeah. So how did Hilda come about then? Well, um, she came about... She was a character that I'd been drawing for a while. Yeah. Before that, but didn't have a story attached to her. She was just... I'd drawn, like, a few pictures. I drew a few pictures of this girl with blue hair, and each time I drew her, she kind of changed quite a bit. I don't even know why I was drawing them. I just had a sort of... I would often draw, like, pictures just for the sake of it. Yeah. Back then, which I, don't, I guess I don't really do so much now. Yeah. Um, Is that a time thing? I guess so, yeah, because I've got lots of other things I should be doing. I mean, I doodle and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I don't... I rarely do a, just a, a picture from scratch and then colour it fully and then yeah. just put it on the internet for no reason, you know. It's usually... <laughs> At least something has instigated that. Yeah. But I had this picture of basically Hilda sat in front of a sort of townscape um, with all kind of like monsters sort of popping up between it. Yeah. Like mountains in the background. It all looked vaguely Scandinavian. I just had this picture and um, I think I had to come up with an idea for that comic fairly quickly. And I came up with a couple of ideas I'd like to do. And then also I just sent them that picture and said I could do something with this but I had nothing more than that yeah picture I didn't really know anything about it so but he, he liked the look of that and um yeah and then I started making up all the details yeah surrounding it you know and gave her came up with a name yeah gave her a sort of very short little story for that thing cause it was only 24 pages yeah yeah and so Hilda's a an ongoing series now it is now yeah yeah Kind of. Kind of. Um, but it's not... I'm trying to keep each book loosely standalone. Yeah, it's kind of um, self-contained stories. Yeah, they don't, they, they're not kind of episodes yeah. necessarily, although there's some stuff that kind of carries on. Yeah, so anyone could pick up at any point. That's what I hope. Yeah, I think so. I do remember one of the, the frustrating things for me when I was younger about reading comics was I always felt I didn't like stuff that was in this... I had the impression that if there's something in a series, I couldn't get into it because I'll never be able to buy all these things. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't even... Yeah, I remember wanting to start buying 2000 AD. Yeah. When I started to get pocket money and stuff. Yeah. But it was like one issue. It was like all my pocket money. And there was just... I'd, I I would flick through it and real, see that, you know, there's like four pages of a story that's already, you know, 40, like well underway. Yeah. Yeah, it just seemed I remember, like a rip off to me. I remember trying to get into. I think I've spoken about this before. I had friends who were into comics, and they were yeah. into you know X Men comics, but you couldn't open them up and read them because they were in plastic. And they had a little book with prices of how much everything was, and so everyone would like talk about, oh, it's this one, and this is worth you know two hundred pounds. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember being you know a bit confused that they weren't reading them, they weren't interested in the stories until someone was reading them, and then you found out you needed to know the backstory of so and so and had the relationship, and it's actually a different universe or something. Such and, and there was yeah. so much like that you needed to know beforehand before you could actually get into it that I, I just didn't bother. Yeah, and I still haven't bothered. I was really, I was yeah. really wanted to be. I think when I was a teenager, I really wanted to be into like superhero comics. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, like really badly, but um, there wasn't for starters. There wasn't a comic shop like accessible to me. Really, I could only get I only saw what was in the newsagents. Yeah, which are these sort of weird repackaged like Marvel comics. I did buy like I sort of like bought the supermarket Spider Man for yeah. a while, whatever that was. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was actually an advert for soap. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's very clean smelling. <laughs> um. Yeah, but I, I remember, like, I always, like, I badly wanted to be into that stuff, and I would read up about that stuff. I'd read up about all the characters. Yeah. Um, well, I, re- I remember really liking the cartoons as well. I remember yeah, thinking yeah, the yeah. cartoons are brilliant. And then, you know, we, we had a comic shop in our town, and, and if you went in, they were all in those long boxes, long boxes, they're called. Mm-hmm. 
and so you needed to be bold enough to go and like you know thumb through them and leaf through these things to actually find them and dig them out and it's it's a lot of you know for someone who's a, maybe a little unsure about how to do it if they're doing it right am I doing this right am I hurting these am I doing it wrong you know as, as I was it was very very difficult to get in I thought yeah mm. see I never I, I feel like I never saw a long box until I was <laughs> not that long ago you know yeah <laughs> With the, it just wasn't this isn't wasn't a comic shop in my town. Yeah, um, I guess it didn't get out much. It's <laughs> 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 fair enough, I guess. Yeah, it it is interesting though. I, I think about this a lot. That there's lots of different uh, worlds in comics that mm. don't tend to overlap an awful lot. Even though what we're practically doing is the same thing. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know where I'm going with that. No. No. But I- <laughs> But I, I, I think, think it's probably true. right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, how do you approach starting a project then? Because we're sat in your studio at the moment, your your mum and dad's bedroom or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> the um, you live alone. That's fine. Well, not alone. No, I don't ah, live alone. You don't. I live okay. with Philippa. You live with Philippa, of course. Yeah. Uh, how does that work then? Because you, you're both cartoonists. Yeah. Does that work? Does it work? I guess yeah. so. Okay, that's fine. This doesn't not work. Cool. I, I always wonder about when you have uh, couples that are both artistic mm-hmm. you know is is it is it great or is it awful artistically speaking I mean there may be some Somewhere kind of grey ground you know, you know, in between like, at times it, it's like it's great because we like a lot of the same stuff we kind of share books yeah and things um, there's always lots to talk about yeah so you know, I mean it is good and she's and um it's good creatively as well. Yeah. For kind of like bouncing ideas around and also just stealing her ideas. Like, to be fair, she, there's a lot of, um, there's a few bits in the Hilda books that like I should flag up basically as her like doing, like there's a few <laughs> kind of like gags and things that she basically came up with. Yeah. And, you know, I just talk because they, <laughs> it worked. Um, but I'm sure it worked I think you just ways. have, yeah. I'm sure I've given her some ideas. Yeah, so maybe. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm certain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you, you start a project, um, what's the, how do you capture that idea? Because I know that you know, if I'm almost falling asleep and I have an idea, I have to write it down. Because if mm-hmm. I if I say to myself, oh, I'll, I'll remember that, never ever will. So, no. how do you how do you capture an idea once you've had it? It's the same way as anyone, I guess. Just try and write it down in some way. Yeah. Just. Yeah. I'll yeah. scribble it down in a sketchbook, just on a piece of paper. Yeah, I guess. Um, well, I think that for me, if as soon as I've you know turned it into ink on paper, like it, it, it's solid and I'll remember it. But if I don't, you know, jot it down, if I think, oh, that's a really great idea, I'll remember. Yeah, it, I just won't. Actually, yeah. I even if I never look at that piece of paper again, I think a lot of the time it isn't solid for me. Like I, I very rarely go back and look at my sketchbooks. Yeah, me neither. Um, I always think I will. Like it's kind of why I'm putting stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. But I never look back and then sometimes I do look back and I like, just there'll be something away. that I've scribbled down and I can't read anymore. Yeah. Or um I always write I always think I should write down any idea that I've had so I write down a lot of really bad ideas. Yeah. Like, really embarrassing ideas and I do think I'm gonna have to destroy you yeah, most yeah. of my sketchbooks at some point because I don't want this stuff <laughs> to be like left for posterity because it's awful it's, 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 just, it's full of the worst ideas yeah, but do you, do you think that with ideas that you know they, they can't all be winners but you've got to give them at least a chance yeah I yeah. mean I feel like you can probably always turn anything into something good if you spend enough time on it yeah I call that, you see lots of people yeah. saying how like it's the dumbest ideas will kind of turn into yeah, the most original ones in the end. Well, I think that you know, I, I don't know about you, but I've got a there, there's a part of my brain that when I'm coming up with ideas, that if the part of my brain goes no, no, no don't do that one, it's probably the one I should pursue. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, because I I think that I know for me, my my first instinct is to go for the easiest, most immediate idea, mm. which I'm always quite wary about because then I think if it's easy, someone else has done it, or if it's easy, then it's it's probably not worth doing. So I'm quite strict yeah. on myself. Yeah, you don't want to do easy. I mean, I've heard someone say that you, with art, you should take the path of most resistance. That sounds sounds about right. Yeah, I think so. Because it is difficult. I mean, all the all the drawing and stuff. 
Yeah, but, no. <laughs> but you know, I, I don't know if there's a path of least resistance in in, in comics, but I, th- I think certainly challenging yourself is a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I th- I th- yeah. Obviously, I think it's always the best idea. So you've you've got an idea, you've captured it on paper, you've put it in a sketchbook. It might be bad, it might be good, or whatever. But you you've got an idea. Um, how do you then start to refine that towards a, an actual book or a, a, an illustration? Well, this is like we're talking about this like I've just been sat around for any kind of like waiting for just an idea, yeah. like with no context. But usually, when I've got to come up with something, there'll be some. There's already some goal yeah. set for it, you know. Yeah. Like, um, like I do often. Like I'm always got a loose idea in my head that I want to do some more mini comics, mm-hmm. like alongside like the hill the stuff I'm d- doing and any other sort of illustration work um I'm always wanting to do like work on some other story just in my own time yeah at a slow pace because I'm pretty I usually end up working on things quite intensely when, once I start on a project yeah um, but I like the idea of having something that doesn't have a deadline and um I can do anything I want um but because there's no reason for it to exist, <laughs> I find it really hard to get anywhere with it. Well, I think that this is, for me, this is a, lo- a lot of the difference between uh, art and illustration. You know, because I think physically it looks the same. You know, you hold a brush and move it around until you've got a picture or whatever. But I think the, the purpose is, is different. I think with illustration, you, you know, someone says, we need you to draw... Um, you know, someone enjoying a barbecue. Mm-hmm. And so you then you, you know when you're finished because you've got a picture of a guy enjoying a barbecue. But I think with the more relaxed approach to doing, you know, something creative as in that kind mm-hmm. of vapour that fills the air, it's it's not as defined, I think, as that outcome. I think that for me is the difference between illustration and art. And I think this is for me the difference between comics and art as well. I mean I don't think of my comics as art. I think I've spoken about this before, but it, it, it's all design. It's designing a story to get to someone's brain. Yeah, well to a certain extent. Um, I think there is a difference whereas when I'm doing when I'm doing an illustration I am just trying like that does feel like there's a job I'm trying to do um but it's not necessarily that ne- that kind of thing isn't necessarily what will like what I was talking about how that will um get me to actually start working on something yeah um what am I saying um <laughs> what, 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 no what I was saying was like I find it like I, I find it impossible to start on something unless there's a reason for it to exist but that reason can just be because someone said they're gonna print it you yeah know? and then that will give me an incentive to do it. Yeah. Even if it is, like, besides that, a completely self-indulgent piece. Yeah. Um, and isn't necessarily for anything ex- except me, like, expressing something, um, you know? Yeah. Um, which which is the kind of thing I... I think that's the case when I'm doing stuff for the No Brow anthologies. Um but there's no real like brief for that. There's yeah. like a word that they give people, just to kind of help them start. But then, um, other than a deadline, there's nothing to really. So you just jump in and go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So how do you start approaching your roughs then? Do you work in pencil or do you work digitally or? Uh, pencil. <laughs> on an- analog pencil on analog paper. Analog pencil on analog paper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can't. I find it really hard to do roughs in the computer. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know. My my brain doesn't sync up with it properly, or something. Yeah. Um, like I'll work digitally more and more often. I think, um, but I can't get that. Like sketching, I just need that kind of physical connections somehow yeah 
Um, I feel like I just need like the most direct like path. Yeah. From. from well, I think brain, you can yeah. just pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and you you're away. But I think yeah. For me, working through the computer, you have to. You know, first of all, you turn it on, then you wait for it to boot up, which isn't very long. It might just be there, but but there's there's a lot more steps. You know, you got to fire up Photoshop, you got to make your document, you got to make sure that you got the right tool, and then, and then you can start. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I, I'm sure that's not a problem for other people. I I can't do it. No, it's just it's just something about the 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 act of just being like like my roughs are like insanely rough. Yeah. Um. You can't, like, I'll do a few pages of, like, thumbnails that look like literally nothing. Yeah. Um, before I kind of, like, I'll know what I'm vaguely getting at when yeah. I'm doing them. Because it's only for you that you're doing them. Yeah. Like, no one else is really going to see yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think it would be different if you were creating thumbnails for someone else to draw? Because uh, that yes. sounds terrifying to me. Thumbnails for someone else to draw, like, um, yeah, but I can't really imagine... I can't imagine me doing, doing that. that. No. Okay, so you got your thumbnails. Uh, how do you then turn that, you know, the idea of your layout and all the rest of it into uh, a page of comics? Well, basically, I'll just keep redrawing that thumbnail in greater detail. Yeah. I guess. Um, I guess, with, like, I was thinking of illustrations then, but I guess with comics, it's even more complicated because you're it's juggling not just one a picture. lot of things and. Um, yeah. I know some people can work kind of page by page, but I, at least for the Hilda books, I've usually got a kind of full outline of stuff that yeah. needs to kind of work. Um, and I'll usually break stuff down into pages without knowing what exactly is going to happen in each one. Yeah. Just kind of roughly break up the story into that amount of chunks. Yeah. Um, and then I'll spend a while... Yeah, I mean, I'll do a few versions of... Of, uh, I'll do like a few kind of thumbnail versions of the page just trying to a lot of it's just guesswork just kind of throwing down like panel arrangements and f figuring out if that could work yeah um, and then I just kind of take a stab at one and then do a bigger version see if all the stuff fits in in a way that makes sense yeah um, and then I'll kind of do a bigger like maybe like an A4 version of the page, but like again, really roughly, just throw all the panels in. Yeah. Um, just can't. I guess I'm just constantly like <laughs> refining it. <laughs> um, so, at what point do you know that it's it's refined enough, or is it just I've know, run out just of time because, now? I've got to draw it. Yeah. Well, that's definitely part of it. Um, and I guess I don't know. I just know. Yeah. I feel like I'll there'll just be a point where it'll just feel. Right, yeah, you know. So it's an intuition thing. Yeah. Okay. I think I think so. Yeah. I okay. Think, um, yeah, and then at that point, I'll um, I'll either draw like again another more slightly more refined version, or I'll scan it in, and what will I do? You tell me. What will I do? <laughs> No, then I guess I'll draw. I'll draw it full size. I guess I'll do it like a full pencil page. Yeah. And then I'll either ink on top of that, yeah. or for the last book, I actually like scanned the pencils and then printed them out in blue line. Oh yeah. And then inked on top of that. Um, but I don't know if I'll do that again because it's sort of, sort of just kind of another layer of faff, and yeah, and I've just got more I mean, more the paper. The, the idea right for around. people who don't know why you do that, mm -hmm. so you you turn all your pencils blue in the computer and then print them out in ink on top, because you can take out the blues without affecting the Yeah, then the when you scan it in, you can just take the blues out and... Yeah. How do you take the blues out? Have you got a particular technique? Because I know this it's uh, a question I get asked a lot. What I do is... Well, it's really hard to think of it without just having Photoshop open. Um, I don't know, something where, like... Is it the channel mixer? Yeah, it might be. Mm. No, uh, maybe. I think I do. I put like a sort of weird filter on that's like black and white. Oh, yeah. Something. And then I move the blue. There's like a couple of little like sliders. Yeah, that's for, like it. blue and something else I knock up and then they just kind of disappear. Yeah. 
Um, I think if you go to the channel mixer under uh, image adjustments, channel mixer, yeah, it's one of the presets. Uh, black what? and white with blue filter. So Not really. Just, yeah, oh. but you could you could record that in an action and just get it to do okay. it for you. You know. Oh, I'll have to. Yeah. yeah, I'll try that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. <laughs> full of tips this podcast i know i love this podcast i got uh, <laughs> i didn't oh, wait, know it's how to do me that. to say is it i didn't know how to do that um photo merge thing until oh, i yeah. did it on here yeah that's it's it's Jesus, golden that saved me a lot of time well, it saves you a lot of money you only need an a4 scanner well yeah but i mean i was i was always um yeah i've always thought you only need an a4 scanner but yeah. i'd be scanning like a hey, two bits of paper in and then Trying to piece them together, by yeah, hand. moving them yeah. all in and overlaying them, spending hours like nudging them around and like rubbing bits out to try and make it work. Yeah. And then there's a button that does it for yeah. you. It's Although it didn't good. totally work when I did it mm. for like if there was more, I can't get it to work unless there's more than if there's more than two. Oh really? Parts. To if it, you got all your really. images the right way up, are they all facing oh, the same direction. That was, the that was the thing that I found. Was, uh, yeah, because I did a, a I scanned in a, an A1 in like lots of little pieces, and they just wouldn't come together. And then I put them all up the right way, and it it was like, oh, I get you, you know, because the computers, it's not an intelligent machine. It's a bit like no. a you know a, a dog that you throw at a stick, and it's like, oh, yeah, your stick. You're like, that's not a stick, you know. <laughs> oh god. Um, okay, so you've got it scanned in. And for the last book, you'd printed out with the blue lines, and you'd ink over the top. What are you yeah. using to ink? Uh, I use. I normally use. Just a pen to brush pen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I don't really like at all because it's always like, it seems super unreliable. Like, I, I, I should really just be using a brush. Like, I recently, <laughs> I, I always thought, like, I did use a brush initially until I found that pen. Yeah. Which then seemed like a godsend. Um, but now it's like, just sometimes it'll start pumping out about three times as much ink. As it should be, yeah. And I'll suddenly it'll be. I feel like I can't draw anymore. Like everything comes out wrong. Yeah. Um. I've got to go through all these, jump through all these hoops, like taking, leaving the cartridge out of it for a while, or like drawing with it loads, just scribbling with it yeah. until for like half an hour until it's kind of working properly again. It's like it's, a three-year-old, isn't it? It's a pain. It's no. It's no real. It's not really any mm. good. Um. I switched back to a brush recently for like a couple of pages I did and surprisingly it's the same but better like there's no really no, it didn't really feel like any more of a chore yeah. you know and it actually worked <laughs> properly so I think I'll probably go so back to that this maybe. is a regular brush yeah I don't even know what brush just one that I had lying around which yeah. even was a bit kind of scruffy so I think if I get a better one then a real nice one yeah it'll be fine but I mean those pens are actually great like I'm being they're very handy yeah yeah considering I've inked every published comic I've ever done with them <laughs> I shouldn't be bad mouthing them too much it's them and Eddie Ross yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> <laughs> cool so you've you've done your line work or uh, do you have a particular kind of paper that you use uh no I don't actually just any old um, paper kind of I mean obviously it's got to be good enough to use for us to kind of like take ink um i'll usually use yeah i don't know just some kind of like cartridge paper pad um it's just kind of thick thick enough to be decent yeah um like i've bought some like nice bristol board and stuff before um which is nice which is really nice yeah, but quite expensive as well. Yeah. And there's this crappy Bristol board, which um, seems more like sort of floppy, shiny paper, oh, which right. I drew a couple of comics on, I think, but it's actually, I found was kind of crappy. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So once you've got your, your line work done, uh, you're scanning it back in and colouring digitally. Yeah. Yeah. So w- what's your method for colouring digitally then? Just, um, I have a, w- a Wacom tablet. I basically just colour in between the lines like a child. Okay. Um, <laughs> for hours and hours. Yeah. Um, so have you ever used any of the um, the flatting multi No, I've seen that they exist, but I've never actually... Yeah, um, I've never had any luck with them. No. I'm, I'm sure I'm doing it. something wrong with it. But I think the, one of the things that I've found about cartoonists talking about how they colour is that everyone's a little bit shy and embarrassed about the way they do it because I think everyone's convinced they're doing it wrong. 
Well, it would just be the most... Like, I do spend... It takes me an obscene amount of time to colour a comics page. And I think... I don't like to talk about it, because if I did find out there was some way <laughs> that I've missed, that everyone else is doing, I'd be mortified. The amount of hours, months of yeah. my life that I would have just thrown away. But, um, yeah, I know that I know those, those, those flatting things exist. Um, yeah. But I, I don't know. There, there, there's lots of sort of shortcuts you can take, it seems. Yeah, um, I think so. Which I do kind of. I've started doing sort of found a way where I can use the magic wand a bit okay yeah um, to just kind of speed things up a little bit um, but I don't know it just seems like I'll get the best results if I just basically just pump hours into it yeah you know <laughs> that, that's fair that's and it fair. feels the closest like because I feel like I am just sat there with a crayon just colouring in like it feels like it's all kind of under my control like I'm not yeah, giving anything up to like an automated process. Yeah, even though it is a drag, it feels. I still feel like I can justify it. It's like an honest yeah. drag. Yeah, yeah. No, I can understand that. That sounds sounds about right. So, have you ever been tempted to colour in traditionally, like with watercolours or you know paints? Mm, no, mm. but also yes, I guess. Right, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to. I don't know, actually. I'd kind of like to be able to. Like, I'd like to have... Like, I, I definitely feel that my stage, my colouring stage, is often quite a big part of it. Like, I really... Like, I feel like my line art is quite sparse sometimes and doesn't look doesn't look or feel like a finished page until I put that colour in. Like, yeah. I do quite a lot at that stage. Um, well, like, and I'll often add stuff kind of on top digitally. Yeah. Like, maybe, like... like There's a lot of snow like in Hilda maybe so I'll, there'll be pages where I'll draw loads of like snow like on top of the line art which yeah. changes the page a lot and I'll, I'll often sort of add stuff like that but I, I get the same thing with mine I mean if you look at my you know sketchbooks where I'm just you know drawing you know figures or whatever yeah. like, the lines by themselves look terrible you know and I think if anyone flicks on my sketchbooks and sees like the uncoloured you know things yeah. I'm doing it looks really really bad but as soon as I put you know a bit of you know, calculated wash to you know describe the volume of it. Yeah. Suddenly, it looks like I've meant to do it all of a sudden. Whereas I think you know a lot of what I'm doing without the color looks pretty shoddy. To yeah. be honest. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to be able to do color traditionally in some way, but then it's like I don't really like. I don't. I don't not like it. <laughs> but I feel like the kind of like a sort of painty, a painterly look in comics, and even like washes necessarily aren't really like my bag yeah I think like I don't they're not something that I want to do in my comics yeah. and I also don't think it would really match with my no I mean because you've got your because I don't have that kind of stuff works with a kind of looser yeah definitely line you know whereas I kind of try to make everything quite tight so I'm looking yeah. for like solid flat colours like mm -hmm. I'd like to be able to achieve that somehow yeah. traditionally which I'm sure I could if I was willing but it's, it's going to be as why. much work I think you know yeah. You know, one of the realisations I had is that no matter how many shortcuts I try and find for what I'm doing like everything still needs drawing and everything still needs colouring in and yeah. I, you know it's, it's all the same amount of work per square inch yeah, yeah, at yeah. the end of the day to be honest more so I'd like to be able to I want to do more black and white comics and I'd like to be able to use black better than I currently do yeah, um, that's an art all by itself, really. Yeah, isn't it? no, it really is. Because my pages do look like sparse. Yeah, I'd like to have. I mean, I mean, most of the comics that I like, I feel are usually kind of black and white comics. So it seems weird that color is so important in most yeah. of the work that I do. I think so. I'd, I'd like to be able to use 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 more more blacks. So what have we got coming up from you then? Uh, what are you working on at the moment? Well, I'm kind of just about to start working in earnest on the Hilda 4 or 3 depending how you look at it <laughs> um, the new Hilda book anyway yeah just kind of been in development over this year but uh, as usual and with you know things happen and yeah. it's only just kind of getting underway so that's what I'll be doing for the next few months yeah um, probably solely and beyond that there aren't any big plans so you're taking things as they come at the moment I mean, that's yeah. I mean, that's how I've always kind of done it. Like for the last sort of three, 
or four years maybe there's never been anything in the pipeline more than like further away than sort of yeah. three months I guess like, I don't know what I'll be doing um, like I said like I, there's some other comics I'm sort of kind of planning there will probably be short form comics but uh, who knows how the, yeah. they might just turn up online or I might print them um, but you know I haven't drawn them there's a good chance I won't draw them so <laughs> Probably you heard it here first. <laughs> about. Um, cool. So, have you got anything you'd like to plug? Uh, anything you'd like? Uh, any uh, websites you'd like to send to people to, or books you'd like people to buy? Well, you could go to my website, mm-hmm. LukePearson.com. I could also plug the. I'm in an exhibition at the minute at the V&A. Yeah. Called Memory Palace. Yes. Um, so, if you go there at the moment, I'm not sure when it's open. I think it stays open till October or November. Oh, okay, cool. Um, but if you go there, I mean, I've got a big, sort of a large-scale comic printed up on the wall. Cool. It's part of an exhibition there. And Isabel Greenberg's in that as well. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, I would plug that. Yeah, and even if you're listening to this in the incredibly distant future, just go and visit the V&A, assuming yeah, it still, ex- well, still exists. Sure I don't will. know how far in the future you're actually listening to this, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice place to go and visit. If you're that far, if you're worrying about whether it exists or not, that exhibition probably won't still probably. be Probably. Well, you know, you've never seen it, though. No, no, it's yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but go there, it's good. Yeah, it's cool. Um, yeah, that's it. And just maybe like your books. books. Yeah. You can go to the No Brow site. Or um, go to know, a just, shop. A just go to shop. a shop. Get out of your house. Take these headphones off and, and go go to a shop. I don't think everyone's wearing these headphones, Dan. Just, just <laughs> well, I wasn't us. talking to you. I was talking to them. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thanks very much for speaking to me, Luke. Yeah, you're very welcome. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much to Luke for having me in his house and speaking to me. And thanks as ever to Jim Guthrie for letting me do his song, Hugging Me to Long Blue, of his album, Now More Than Ever. Please go and buy it. This is Making That Tell Everybody.